My name is Galoosh. I'm from the United States. And this is episode three of a Beatboxer's Life documentary. I started beatboxing after hearing a b-boy dancing and a beatboxer beatboxing in the dining hall of South Kent School in uh, South Kent, Connecticut. Uh, it was an exchange student who was really into hip hop and uh, dancing with his friend who was beatboxing. I went up to this person um, and learned my first ever sound. <laughs> that, that first inward pulling kind of PF snare sound. Um, and I was hooked, absolutely hooked. Um, later on, I got to expand it outward into um, acapella music, into uh, you know, going beyond just the instrumental music I was doing at the time. I used to be in uh, the jazz band and concert band stuff when I was younger, but my high school didn't have an instrumental program, so I was only doing choir after that, and that sort of forced me to dig into what I could be doing in the limited space, right? Without instruments, what else, what other ways of making music are there? Um, and uh, while I was going through that, I started finding myself being more and more drawn into making, you know, entirely vocal music. So uh, interested in acapella music, diving more and more into hip hop and the beatboxing tradition. So finding, you know, the YouTube rabbit hole that you can go down and, um, sort of exploring that. When I first got the chance to go to a live beatboxing event, that was, um, I believe, like late 2016, early 2017, I got to go visit one of the beatbox house. They were doing a live show uh, at uh, the Poisson Rouge in New York City. Um, it was a joint show with uh, The Lesson GK, who I'm also a big fan of now. Um, getting to see that show live was, was incredible. I got to you know share some awesome moments meeting you know, the beatbox house guys for the first time. Um, and that one really sort of brought me into the in-person live events scene. And since then, um, that has been my, by far my preferred way of being here. First competition I ever did was the 2017 American Beatboxing Championships, where I did a solo a limb, um, and it wasn't really my time for the loop station yet. Um, and the biggest takeaways from there was the, uh, aside from getting, you know, just like the mind blowing show and performance of all the, of, of it all, um, getting to meet some of the people that would then kind of form the important bonds with that would kind of carry me through the rest of the um, competitive uh, time. So that first 2017 American Beatbox Championships, you know, the time in the uh, in the Q4, something like that, hostel. The the hotel we were all staying in, everyone was staying there. And um, there was like a kind of communal space that everyone was hanging out in down in the basement like after the show or before before we all left for it. Um, and, and those times were like one of the first real moments of, oh, these are people outside of the YouTube videos. You know, oh, these are the people who you can talk with who are just musicians making their stuff. Um, and that was, uh, one of the important kind of like realizations there was, uh, you, I could start kind of getting over the whole like starstruckness or whatever you want to call it of, um, going from like the digital meeting people to the in-person meeting people, um, with kind of better fluidity. So I started looping with a chaos pad that I got myself right before my fifth year of high school. I did a repeat senior year. Uh, and while I was there at Hotchkiss, uh, in Connecticut, I got myself kind of set up with this chaos pad and did some of like the one bank looping stuff, uh, with like a horrible sound setup and like bad, you know, RCA cables and stuff. Just the audio quality was garbage. Um, but meeting up with, you know, some other people who are interested in beatboxing at that school, um, you know, especially for, like, from the acapella group there. Uh, I got to dive more into like the electronics too. So having some people who were um, really supportive of me uh, at that school and said like, "Oh, this is really cool. Keep doing this." And I was like, "Okay, there's something. There's something here, and I can expand the understanding and the knowledge of the machinery and the mechanics and all of that, and really go places with this thing." 
because um, it comes back to that whole drive earlier of wanting to be self-sufficient musically. So looping, I initially kind of got into because it was able to expand and multiply exponentially what I was able to actually create, um, especially early on when I was not quite as good of a beatboxer yet, where I wasn't really able to make the um, songs and the, and the beats and whatnot that I wanted to uh, just through solo beatboxing and singing at the same time and all of those things. The, f the first track that I really made that I was proud of and really kind of came together um, structurally like as a cohesive piece uh, was my song You and I. Uh, I used that as my entry for the first Great North beatbox battle that I went to, I think it was the 2018 one. Um, and I filmed it in a little like side closet studio space at my college, uh, I think in my freshman year. Um, but that one definitely became a sort of starting point for what I was doing. I, I, I was really kind of digging into the uh, vocal layering stuff. I did some overtone singing as I kind of was like really interested in doing early on. Um, and it gave it this kind of, you know, unique and original sound uh, that just, I think pretty effectively, like conveyed, here's where I am with my music right now. And this is gonna be a little time capsule snapshot of what I am. Uh, and the song was really important because it was also a very meaningful one, uh, one that I had written uh, based on my relationship with my now fiance. Uh, so that was really kind of a meaningful starting point. Um, and um, because like she was, you know, there for me in so many important ways uh, that you know I wouldn't have been able to continue doing what I'm what I've been doing without her. Um, and you know, when she was with me at the 2018 American Champs, people were coming up to her and be like, "Hey, who's this? Like, who's uh, uh, you know, like you must love beatboxing or something. Why are you here?" And get, getting to see her like talk about, you know, oh, I knew Galoosh before he was a beatboxer. It was like, what crazy? <laughs> uh, definitely a fun, a fun thing uh, for that. But so let's break down uh, the Winter Games tournament then. Uh, that one I think was a really exceptional. A uh, bit of competing. I think because my preparation was such that I had focused in so much on using some covers to push my technical knowledge without the uh, limitations of having to be like creatively generating material as well. Um, like I don't have to you know, write the song, I can creatively reinterpret the song. It gives me a lot more to work with starting off so I can have a lot more like um, freedom to be creative in other ways that aren't quite so like emotionally involved. Like, you, like th th there's a huge difference between the emotional process of creating your original songs versus a cover. You don't have to necessarily like stake your creative and artistic identity on a cover of a song. You might like it. You might agree with the emotional things that they're doing in there, but it's not yours in the same way. Um, so getting the chance to really dive in and using covers consciously as a choice to give me some more space to figure out techniques I wanted to expand on and really kind of develop uh, the galoosh sound um, as it was. That showed up in the, in, the, in the tournament by way of my first battle with Slether, for example. Um, I think that the choices to not really overthink who I'm battling against or what they're doing or what genre things are expected and really kind of just perform my new stuff. Um, that was really my mindset going into it. And when it comes to the battles and the, and the um, preparation stuff, obviously like you can go into all that stuff like, oh, I know this leather does these of does you know these effects really well or has this stylistic thing or is really good at this genre so I should do this or that to prepare for it that kind of stuff I, I definitely do all of that but more importantly I think to me has always been how am I gonna be able to get my point across or like how am I gonna be able to make it so even if I were to lose or whatever whatever the outcome is there's still a very memorable moment for me um, because at the end of the day, if you can make yourself memorable and engage with the 
audience of the whole show, the battle is a way of presenting a medium here. It's, it's, it's like the uh, it, it's it's just a format to perform in that's more engaging for an audience because they want to see competitiveness, right? At the end of the day, I'm still just playing songs. Um, so my second battle versus uh, Epos from the UK. Um, that one was crazy because it went into overtime and uh, he brought out this incredible track in the second round that he then later perfected even more and had an incredible kind of final version of it. If he had played the final version of that versus me, I definitely, I definitely would have lost. Um, but it was just timing wise, it was like my tracks were just kind of finished and complete and he was still in that like building phase for, for the tracks he chose to use in that battle. Um, which I was super guilty of all the time, right? I, all the time I have tracks that I use too early before they're really done and kind of um, come into their own sort of... They're, they're, they're more kind of synthesized or whatever uh, and, and, and complete sounding or complete feeling. And I think that's a really tough thing is to figure out the... Um, it's really tough to know when a song is ready versus when it's still cooking and when you still have to wait a little longer um, to see what little tweaks you can make here and there, or structural things you can do to better convey the musical ideas that you have. Because um, battling-wise, it's really all about that. It's how well does this person convey their musical ideas versus this other person. And in the finals versus m -Age, it came down to, I think, uh, how much was I able to convey the excitement and just kind of giddiness and energy behind the tracks I was doing in that last round. Um, and really having to like sell it, but in a very authentic and like kind of complete way, having to sell that energy and really kind of get infectious with it. That was what I was totally incapable of doing at the American Champs a couple years before. That was the missing sauce that I didn't have as a live performer um, that really held me back from doing well in those in those spaces, right? The the lack of live experience, the lack of believing enough in the uh, fun and engaging energy of live performing, um, and getting to have more experience with that recently has been like the conscious push for me as a performer. I want to be doing live shows, live performances. That's really where I want to focus my energy on because that's where I feel like I'm now most capable and most set apart, right? There's a ridiculously incredible uh, core of uh, online looping performers now. How many of them are gonna be able to do kick-ass live shows? Over, I think, June and like July of this past summer, uh, when there was more ability uh, pandemic-wise to get live shows happening again, I made the conscious push to like book as much stuff performing live as possible. So that has more than anything really helped me dial in just the technical stuff of my set, of my show, making stuff, you know, um, really work well for a live show as it comes out of big speakers, not mastered through a thing for a YouTube video. Um, and the feedback that I've gotten from the 30 something crowds that I've performed to since then, um, has been awesome uh, and, and, and super important to figuring out what's going to work well for a stage full of beat, for a, rather, for a uh, audience full of beatboxers versus an audience full of people who might just follow you on Instagram and subscribe to your YouTube channel, that kind of thing, right? Uh, people who are just there to um, be like a true fan, right? The kind that uh, will put other people on to you because they just like your music and will, you know, watch any and all of your content or uh, stuff that you make, regardless of how good it is or how trendy or like viral oriented it is. So my, my live set is really all about uh, convincing people that it's worth it out of all of the millions of people they could be following to follow me or to... Uh, believe in the messages and the authenticity and the thought process and the technique and the skill and the talent and all that, all that stuff that all goes into it of my show, you know? 
because uh, if, if you think about it a little bit like the pie in the sky, uh, I kind of like, like you know, kind of like a, a lack mindset. Um, if there's you know, if, if you're if you're watching so if you're watching this one video, you're not watching all the other that you could be. So at the end of the day, some of it is um, really about when 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 I'm when I'm live, I'm trying to put on the best possible version of what I would want to see on a live show, right? Um, I think that's really important too, right? Is that there's so much happening in the competitive world that like the algorithm for becoming viral is there's a meta, there's a you know, most effective tactic available. You do this and you'll be successful. You do this and you'll win the battle. You do this and people will do what, you're, what you want them to do. Um, they'll support you in some way. But to me, the only real and genuine and authentic way to do that, to build the, fan, the kinds of fans and the kind of following that will share your stuff with their grandpa or whatever, is gonna be the kind that connect with you authentically and can see past the presentation to the authentic artist behind that. So when I consider my live shows, I make sure that everything I'm doing is both authentically me, as fun as I can make it, and as if I was in the audience, what would I wanna see up there? And what would I wanna to listen to? Um, I make sure that that's totally divorced from the competitive side of things, from the competitions and whatnot. I think competitions are a great way to, you know, build a skill set and to have a pretty accessible platform to perform a little bit and to, you know, put out your stuff. But at the end of the day, that's not the end goal. That's not the end game. No one is just going to be a battler forever. Everyone, I think, deep down is realizing that, like, battling... It is a mode of getting somewhere else. It is a formula for success. You win GBB, you get to go do other, other way cooler things because that gets you the audience and that gets you the viral clicks and whatnot. The, op the, the, the strategy that I think I'm more aligned with is I'm going to connect genuinely and authentically making a memorable lasting impact with fewer people at a time and those people are going to stick with me longer than the 15 second TikTok that you're scrolling through. So that's my strategy and my mindset going into live performing. Obviously, the technical stuff of, you know, sound and whatnot, that's a whole other deal, right? It, it, it's, it's just got to slap. You got to, you know, don't drown your snares in reverb. Maintain the dynamic range. I don't know. Keep the attack of your sound. <laughs> yeah. And um, next next question is, uh, of course, uh, which is your most satisfied uh, track that you've ever made? So I think the track that was most satisfying to make for me, um, it's a tough one. I like that question, though. Um, I mean, the first one that comes to mind is Permanent Timeout because of how it started off in a completely different direction, and I let it keep cooking for a long time. <laughs> um, that one was the kind of song that like started off as a cover with a totally different thing, with a totally different like structure and sound to it. Um, and through a mixture of like realizing that, oh, I can keep certain elements of this and then add enough new stuff and write some new lyrics and all of a sudden it's my own original song, right? It's kind of like that total uh, cheating the system. You just cover someone else's song and write new lyrics for it, and then if it's different enough, it's yours. Um, you know? Yeah. Tell, tell me in the comments which one you thought it was. <laughs> like, what do you, so, Pyramid Time Out started off as a cover. What do you think it started off as? <laughs> There's like 12 people who would know that just because they were at one live show where I did the earlier version and it was the cover version. Uh, or, you know, my fiance would know that. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Okay, sorry. So, when it comes to the most satisfying track, I think it's the ones that like you get to cook the longest and really feel good about um, being in a final form. Um, I think that Gast was another one where I kind of thought I was there and had a finished version of it, the one that was in uh, the winter tournament, and then I let it keep cooking. I had a new kind of second uh, structural change to it at the end, and that's the, that's the version that I used uh, in like more recent, like later on things. Um, 
And that one's just like a fun track. Uh, it doesn't, you know, have the same level of, I don't know, pretty melodies and lyrics and stuff. It's just a fun, you know, you get to headbang a little bit. Um, the satisfying ones, the, the, the last or more, rather most recent satisfying one was my uh, song Get It, which is from the uh, wildcard thing I did recently. That one was born of the conscious choice to be like, I'm going to try and actively choose to be creative from a different angle today. I'm going to try and make it all about sound design and see what uh, I can happen, see what I can make happen with the techniques available um, to like force that to be like the nexus of creation as opposed to like, what is the melody going to be? What's the chord progression going to be? How am I going to do like songwriting changes in here? How am I going to, you know, present that as the sort of like creative direction from the start? Um, Get It was one where I chose from the beginning. I'm going to make this song based on cool sound design and I'm going to figure out some cool stuff about it and then make and then kind of reverse engineer that into a song structurally after the fact. Um, and I think it worked out really, really well. I'm very proud of that track. And again, that's another one that's like not lyrics heavy, uh, but it has a very specific and I think very authentically galoosh sound. If you heard that song, um, you'd be able to know it was me making it, whether or not you knew it was me. Um, for me, that's really the goal at the end of the day is to make music that regardless of like, you know, what genre it's in or where you hear it or in what context it was, you know, like, oh, that's galoosh making that sound, right? Um, there are producers and artists that I really look up to who have really accomplished that and are just kind of incredibly successful at, uh, even if they're like, you know, ghost writing or like producing for other big artists, I'm like, oh, I know that's that guy's song, even if it was like sung by someone else. Like, and I check, I'm like, oh yeah, no, right there are the credits, produced by this person. I'm like, that, like that's, that's what I want. I want to be able to nail it so that regardless of what the context is, if you hear my music, you know it's by me. That would be like the biggest indicator of success for me, aside from like, you know, the numbers and stats and following and all that stuff. Why do you like Ube? Ooh, I hate it. It's the worst. I'm stuck in it. I can't do anything else. <laughs> but to explain that a little bit, <laughs> um, it's addictive. First of all, it's super engaging for like my uh, particular attention and musical creative instincts. Um, and it's an interesting way of performing that is dependent on an audience to make sense. Your audience has to understand what you're doing for them to get what to get for them to like get included in the whole thing, right? Like when we think about the like the huge stadium rock uh, crowds of a million people at some like Woodstock type event where there's just that much buy-in and understanding and connection musically and creatively and culturally and all that stuff, it's because everyone gets why it works. They're all there. They all understand what's happening and why it's awesome, and they feel awesome about it. Looping is not gonna do that for so many people, especially at the rate that we're going where you can do this whole kind of magical, not understandable to the lay person thing of creating stuff electronically that's not there before. Um, that doesn't have that kind of clear progression of, oh, here's the beatbox I did, and here it is again where I looped it, and oh, I make a new track that way. Um, the average audience that's not a beatboxer or not a looper already is not going to have the uh, either technical understanding to appreciate it at the right level or musical aesthetic conventions that allow them to enjoy it, right? Looping is not fun to listen to if you are subscribing to the musical aesthetics of a lot of different other ways of making music, right? It's not fun to listen to someone kind of make a track and like build stuff up and like have no real rhyme or reason for it until, oh, this whole time I was making all this stuff and you couldn't hear it. 
Go. What is really effective about it is the technology's flexibility and fluidity for improvising, for creating something idea-wise, songwriting-wise, um, structurally, rhythmically, all those things um, in a way that's faster than any other possible way of making music, right? The amazing thing about looping is that you can make the most complete and sonically expansive and uh, incredible sounding music the fastest, right? No one in a, in a studio can build any of Kristoff's songs in under three minutes, right? Just not happening, right? And obviously, we're ignoring the fact that Kristoff spends thousands of hours building all the presets and all of the electronic process. That's all beforehand, but you get, you get what I mean. Where the track doesn't exist technically until he makes it, and that is faster than any other way of making music. You cannot do anything faster than looping when it comes to going from nothing to a lot. It's not good, it's not the best, but it's a lot. You can make a lot of music in no time at all. And I think that that's the gratification, the um, reason you, you might want to do it. Do not practice another sound. Do not practice another technique until you learn where this stuff comes from. Because that is how you get better at beatboxing. You understand where it comes from and why you, as a person, as a creative, in a specific cultural context, are doing what you're doing. Otherwise, there's no way to be successful with it.
Volkota as the champion, I do believe, right there in a three to two division going back and forth. What's up? My name is Volkota. I'm from the United States. And this is episode four of a B-Boxers Live documentary.